There was a dream that no pharaoh could ignore because it had the Nile in it. Well, the Nile was so important in Egypt, Egypt couldn't survive without the Nile. And here was a dream with a, the with a Nile uh, central to it. It had cows in it. Well, cows were the most important among the most important domesticated animals in Egypt, you might know that Egyptians had a, cow, a goddess in the shape of a cow who had a big sun disc between her horns. You might have seen the picture of Hathor or Isis, she's called. That's how important cows were. They even had a goddess in the shape of a cow. Corn and grain. Egypt was the granary of ancient of the ancient Near East that's where the food came from and so with these things in this dream big things important things Egyptian things no pharaoh could have ignored that dream and thought nah it's, it's nonsense but then it had cows eating cows what and thin and scrawny cows eating big fat healthy cows and they didn't look any different what they'd eat once they'd eaten them what and then ears of corn eating other ears of corn no wonder when pharaoh woke up he thought what is going on what was that about in the morning his mind was troubled he called the experts egyptians that actually had uh, books to explain dreams. They, they, they got, they, they, they've still they found examples of these books of uh, dreams where they would bring explanations. Well, uh, the books provide no solution. The experts, the uh, wise men and the magicians, they come up with no answers. So Pharaoh's getting more worried. Well, I've got to find out what this dream means. What does it mean? My experts can't tell me. He's increasingly disturbed. Now the cupbearer remembers. Dear Joseph, there, we had those dreams. He tells Pharaoh as the cupbearer, he would have been attending uh, Pharaoh uh, and he would have uh, seen Pharaoh's agitation. I remember we had a dream when you threw us into prison two years ago uh, and a Hebrew there told us our dreams, he explained what they were, and they came true just as Joseph said. Well, Pharaoh sent for Joseph. He was quickly brought from the dungeon. Uh, they had him shaved and changed his clothes, and he came before Pharaoh. When Joseph arrives on the scene in this drama, God is put front and centre. I don't know if you realise that as we were reading through, when Joseph comes on the scene, God is now front and centre in the story. Let's see how that happens in this unfolding drama. First of all, Joseph points to God as the revealer of the dream. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Verse 16, I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. You've got to look away from me. You've got to look to God for the answer. So Joseph wants to make sure that he's not front and centre. It's God you've got to look to. You remember, he'd said the same thing to those, the cupbearer and the baker, when they uh, uh, said in chapter 40, verse 8, we both had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Uh, we have a, a, a later echo of this in the book of Daniel. And there are many parallels uh, there in Daniel. Daniel chapter 2 and uh, verse... 26, the king asked Daniel, um, this is Nebuchadnezzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel 2, 27, Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. 
That's what Joseph does. It's God who has the answer. And uh, it's God who will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Some uh, translations uh, give Pharaoh a favourable answer. Literally, it's an answer of peace. I don't think Joseph is promising there's going to be a good interpretation to this dream. What Joseph is saying is that God will bring you peace in the midst of your agitation. You're agitated because you haven't got an answer. God will give you the answer that will give you peace regarding the meaning of this dream. God has the answer. Well, uh, it's interesting again that, uh, yes, Joseph, uh, uh, Daniel, the Apostle Paul says the same thing when he's speaking about his ministry in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Such confidence, he says, as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant. God's servants always point away from themselves to God. It's God you've got to look to, Pharaoh, not to me, not to man, not to your experts, not to your books. You've got to look to God for the answer to your dream. It's God who reveals. God is front and centre as the God who reveals. But then God is also front and centre, uh, according to Joseph, as the God who controls. Pharaoh uh, relates the dream uh, to Joseph, uh, perhaps more vividly than it was recorded earlier. Uh, these uh, cows come up and graze in the reeds. Seven other cows came up, verse 19, scrawny, very ugly and lean. I'd never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up. First. Even after they ate, no one could tell they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. And he wakes up uh, and then he relates the dream about the, uh, uh, the corn or the grain uh, as well. Notice what Joseph says in verse 25. Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. So God is not only reveals, God is the one who controls. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. He explains that the sevens are relating to years. There are going to be seven good years and followed by seven famine years. Verse 28, again, it is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. He underlines the fact God is in control. Uh, he explains again uh, that the, the, the famine is going to be so severe, the plentiful years will be forgotten. Verse 32, the reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. God is going to send seven years of rich plenty, followed by seven years of severe famine. God is in control. God is in control of the climate. <laughs> we need to be reminded of that, don't we? We're in control. We can get the climate back under control. No, God is in control of the climate. Not Pharaoh. Not the gods of Egypt. They'd made a god of the Nile. <laughs> no, no, the gods of Egypt are in control. God is in control. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. It's been fixed by God, and God will do it soon. The uh, Heidelberg Catechism asks, what do you understand by the providence of God? The almighty and ever-present power of God, whereby he still upholds, as it were by his own hand, heaven and earth, together with all creatures, and rules in such a way that leaves and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and unfruitful years, food and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty and everything else 
comes to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. God is in control, Pharaoh. And God has told you what he's about to do in your country. And uh, uh, you need to reckon with that. It's God who reveals, it's God who controls, uh, and uh, uh, he's graciously revealed to you what he is about to do. That doesn't lead to fatalism. Well, whatever will be, will be. No, uh, now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt to make sure that there's preparation made for those coming years of famine. There's going to be seven years of plenty, well, take 20% uh, uh, of all that's grown, store it up for the years uh, coming, uh, make preparations uh, uh, so that the land of Egypt is not ruined by the famine. Uh, God is being gracious uh, to the Egyptians. Yeah, we know behind that, God's plan is to provide for his people so that they can come to Egypt to be provided for, as we're going to see as the stories unfolds. Uh, Karen says God has got ten times more love for his people than for the Egyptians, but the Egyptians know something of God's love, uh, so uh, they're not ruined uh, by the coming famine. God front and centre as the God who reveals, the God who controls, and then thirdly, God is front and centre as the God who enables. The God who enables. So Joseph has said you need to look for a discerning and wise man, uh, put him in charge of the land of Egypt to make provision for those coming, uh, uh, that coming famine. So Joseph is given the job, verse 41. Pharaoh said to Joseph, hereby, uh, sorry, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. Remember Psalm 105 told us that when Joseph was put in prison, his feet were put in shackles and an iron collar was put around his neck. What a change! <laughs> there's no iron collar now, there's a gold chain around his neck. He's made to ride in uh, the chariot as his second in command. Men shouted before him, make way. Matthew Henry says this, Pharaoh put upon Joseph all the marks of honour imaginable and uh, to recommend him to the esteem and respect of the people as the king's favourite and whom he delighted to honour. Deja vu. Didn't Jacob do that to Joseph? Gave him that robe. Look, you've got to honour uh, this, uh, my son, he, that was the, uh, what he was saying to the brothers. Here's my favourite. Well, this is Jacob's robe on steroids, isn't it? Uh, uh, this is the greatest honour imaginable uh, that is being given uh, by Pharaoh. Why does Pharaoh do this? Why does he think that Joseph deserves this position? Notice what Pharaoh says uh, after Joseph has explained uh, the plan, uh, verse 38, Pharaoh asked them, his officials, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Verse 39, Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You're the man, because you're God's man. That's what Pharaoh says. It's because you have the Spirit of God uh, and God has revealed these things to you. And so Pharaoh uh, promotes Joseph to this position because he is God's man, because God has enabled him. It's not because of uh, his favoritism, like it was with Jacob. It's because now he is God's man. Uh, and God has enabled him to be uh, wise and discerning, uh, because it's God who is behind Joseph's ability. And Pharaoh recognises that, and that's why Pharaoh promotes him as he does. You're the man, 
because you're God's man. And uh, again, Joseph is learning from this, isn't he? Surely I was promoted. Well, I was given all these uh, trappings of honour by my father, but that was because of his favouritism. That was his whim. This is because God has enabled me. And uh, again, remember that Joseph has put God front and centre. I can't tell you. I can't tell you what your dream means. God uh, reveals. Uh, and God is in control. Uh, and so that's recognised uh, in his promotion. God uh, enables uh, and uh, Pharaoh recognises that. And God is front and central uh, as he enables Joseph uh, with the skills that he needs. And then uh, uh, the, the other way that God is front and central in this passage is that God relieves Joseph uh, of the burdens of the past. Verse 50, uh, he's married uh, to uh, the daughter of a priest uh, and uh, we read in verse 50, before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh, and he said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. In the naming of his sons, Joseph confesses that God is the one who has turned things around for him. Not Pharaoh, not Lady Luck, uh, not better circumstances, not even his wife and child, children. It's God who has turned things around for me. And the names of his sons are a, a reminder to him of that and a confession and profession to others of that. Isn't he saying to Pharaoh, yeah, thanks for these honours you've given me and this position uh, and uh, reinforcing it, marrying me into this uh, grand family. But it's God who has at work and brought relief for me uh, from my trouble uh, and my father's house. So what does he mean, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's house? The word trouble is related to toil. It's used of labouring, uh, particularly in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, your labour under the sun, it's toil. And I think Joseph is referring to those years of slavery uh, in uh, Potiphar's house. Uh, and uh, that's his sense of uh, uh, that uh, hardship. And therefore, what led to it? Uh, his brother's conduct. I think that's what he means by his father's house he's not forgotten uh, Jacob and his family uh, and it's clearly he's not saying that Egypt is now my home because he says Ephraim God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering Egypt is the land of my suffering it's not my home my heart's still there but Joseph has now overcome the uh, the burden uh, of uh, uh, that past and Ephraim God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Uh, suffering is the word uh, that's used of misery uh, resulting from abuse and oppression. It was used earlier in Genesis uh, of Hagar uh, and uh, when Sarah was making life miserable for her Jacob uh, when he was uh, being abused by Laban uh, in terms of his wages and so on. It's misery resulting from abuse and oppression. I think Joseph is speaking about his imprisonment there. These are things that occupied uh, Joseph, didn't they, back in chapter 40, uh, when he uh, reveals the dreams uh, to the cupbearer. He says in chapter 40, verse 14, when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness, mention me to Pharaoh, get me out of this prison, for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. They were things that were a burden to Joseph. He was, his mind was occupied with them. Well, God has brought relief in bringing uh, uh, the situation uh, uh, to uh, this now. It's God at work. God is front and centre. 
as the one who reveals, as the one who controls, as the one who enables, as the one who relieves uh, Joseph these burdens. God front and centre. That's where God should be. So first of all, we have to admit that there's our failure here to put God front and centre. So often, isn't it? It's me. <laughs> I'm front and centre. I want to be in that position. No, no, God must be front and centre. So we need to confess our failure to put God in the right place in our lives, to confess boldly, as uh, uh, Joseph uh, does, that it's... I am what I am by the grace of God. We need to have God, and we fail to do that. We've put ourselves in the front. We've made ourselves centre. That's what sin is. Uh, robbing God of his rightful place uh, and uh, making the universe revolve around us. But then we're to give thanks that Jesus perfectly and fully had God front and centre. Where we failed, Jesus was perfect. What does he say in John 6? For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. He says very clearly, repeatedly again in John's Gospel, the words I speak, they're God's words. The, the works I do, they're God's works. What does he say in that prayer in John 17? I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. As uh, Psalm 115 verse 1 says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. Jesus did that perfectly. And so we can come to him and hide as it were, in his righteousness, our failure is covered by Christ, the one who, for whom God was uh, first and centre in everything and always. So we admit our failure and we confess our sin. We trust in Christ to cover us uh, uh, by his perfection. Uh, in putting God front and centre, and then suffering for us and our sin at the cross. All our selfishness and greed, uh, all our turned in on ourselves, Christ paid for that uh, at the cross. But having trusted Christ, we then must live with God front and centre. Uh, we must echo the words of the Apostle Paul, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. That's Joseph's confession, isn't it? That's Paul's confession. That must be our confession to confess and profess. I am what I am by the grace of God. And it's by God's grace, that I achieve anything and do anything. God must be first and uh, central. And uh, that must be clear to people. That was clear to those who saw Joseph. And we must uh, seek to make it clear to those that see us. That God is front and centre for his glory and honour. Let's pray. Our God, we do ask forgiveness and pardon that we fail to put you front and centre. Sorry for our selfish sin. Thank you for the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ who has done completely what we failed completely to do. Thank you that he brought glory to you. Lord, thank you that we can uh, hide in his righteousness uh, and have it as ours by faith, by believing. You see us as good as Jesus when we believe in him. Lord, thank you for your mercy.
but grant us, Lord, uh, to be uh, as clear in our confession and profession as Joseph was, so that others will see that God is front and centre for his glory and honour. Amen. We're going to sing the words of that psalm, not to us be glory given, but to him who reigns above. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will 
and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen.